for joining us today. This is going to be an early trick or treat. It'll be a treat, I guarantee you. This is exciting. Thanks for all, uh, all of you again for joining us. So what are we here to talk about and think about? We're here to talk about applying to academic jobs, how to think about uh, an application letter, uh, polishing a resume, uh, what the search committees on these processes might be looking for. Uh, it can be a daunting challenge. It can be, uh, uh, I don't know, like the Wizard of Oz moment. Like what's happening behind that, that curtain? You're on the other side of it. It's, it's not at all obvious. Um, so we're delighted to have a post of, uh, or have a panel of UNLV faculty who are here to share their thoughts and experiences on this process with you. And they come from different fields, so we'll see some similarities and differences, probably in their experiences and advice. Um, so we have Christy Strong, who comes from the School of Life Science. She's a faculty in residence, got her PhD a few years ago. Um, so she's, uh, again, an early career scholar who's gone through this process and can give you a flavor of some of the things perhaps uh, to expect uh, in um, tenure track faculty jobs, teaching oriented positions, a host of other considerations. Uh, C.B. Choi uh, joins us from the William F. Hara College of Hotel Administration. He came uh, with his PhD from Penn State, uh, but also recently an assistant professor here. And then uh, Renita Ray uh, is a professor in sociology who got her PhD at the University of Connecticut also within just the last few years. Uh, so again, all three of them were in the shoes that you're in only a few years ago. So this probably is very, 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 very emotionally salient to each of you accordingly um, and, and, and in that you're speaking to folks who, again, get your situation and the kinds of things you may have. So I've asked each of them to spend about seven to ten minutes just sharing their pointers and experiences and that will allow plenty of discussion. So each of you should have questions, uh, formulate those. We can see how we want to do this if we want to ask questions as we go or hold them till the end. We're flexible in the timing of that. So again, thanks for joining us, and we'll turn it over. Uh, any thoughts on an order here? We could just go right to left, I suppose. Does that? As long as I can. I got to teach at 2.30. So yeah, teach at 2.00. Well, okay. So why don't, well, in that case, why don't we go left or right? Okay. How about that? So we'll hear uh, from Dr. Strong first. I like pictures. So I'll use pictures to illustrate. So. From a science background, there's different ways that you can look for job postings. So you can go to your primary literature sources. So for most of you, you guys have the go-to journals that you look for for research, right? Generally, what you'll see is a lot of high-profile labs are going to advertise positions in those journals. And so for biologists, science. If you want one of those really competitive placements, you're going to go to science and see, okay, what are the requirements, what are they offering, that sort of thing. If you're thinking more general, you can do postdoc jobs and you can narrow down what you're looking for because maybe you have a specialization that would be great for a certain job but not so great for other jobs, skill sets. And so you'll be able to you know, tweak it, basically. Uh, Indeed is also another one that you can do. Um, for a lot of people, they think that you have to do a postdoc with an academic institution in order to eventually secure an academic position. That's not necessarily the case. Um, sometimes you can go work for the journals that actually publish the articles you're interested in, and you can get that background and start networking through those. And so um, AAAS, they have placements that you can go ad for, you know, go um, apply for. ProMega, so with sciences, um, we have a lot of different uh, science-based companies that we purchase our reagents, what have you, through. And so that can be a really good source of networking because you can go work for ProMega, you can go work for um, Thermo Fisher, NEB, get some on-premise training for using all the different instruments, what have you, um, specialization, and then when you go show the other researchers how to use this, they remember you. And so then if you want to jump into their lab, I showed you how to use this instrument. I'm already an expert in it. Why wouldn't you take me? So that can be leaving off points. Because a lot of people, they think, I have to do a postdoc in academia. You don't have to do a postdoc in academia. There are other options, and you should consider op other options, because you want to stand out compared to everybody else. Because there are a lot of people right now that are finishing up their PhDs, and there's not a lot of positions. And so what's going to make you unique compared to any other applicant that's out there? So thinking outside the box can give you an advantage. And then um, universities. So when you have a university-based postdoc, they have to advertise it on their websites. And so if you go to universities that you're interested in, maybe you know that um, the pharmaceutical triangle in North Carolina 
Virginia and Tennessee, you're really interested in that, you go look at the universities there and see who is actually advertising spots. They may not have a postdoc open, but maybe they have a position that's one step down, but it gets you a foot in the door. So you shouldn't be afraid to take positions you might think are entry level because they may be able to get you in the door, get you that relationship that you need in order to get you the position that you want. So some job advertisements aren't posted. You're not going to know about them unless you're networking. So meetings, right? The idea is when you guys are graduate students, you should be going out and sharing your results in your field, ideally. Um, that could be local meetings, that could be regional meetings, national meetings international meetings, right? And so that's your place to shine. You should be thinking of that like it's a job interview because generally they'll publish the abstract four to seven days before the meeting. You can see who's there. You can see who you're interested in and try to hook up with them. So if they have students that are presenting material, you should be sitting in on that student's presentation. If, you know, you have they have posters being presented. You should be networking with those people because people are more friendly at these meetings. They're easier to you know, contact because they're supposed to be open to sharing research and it gives you an idea that, hey, come look at my poster. Come listen to my talk. And then we can discuss how my stuff relates to your stuff. So network, network, network. Okay? And then uh, research gate. So for us scientists, um, putting out your papers on this so that you can network within the science field. Because if you're accessible to other scientists, they're more likely to be accessible to you. And you can make contacts. So, you know, someone requests a paper for me, okay, I make note of who that person was and who are they on papers with? And am I interested in meeting any of those people? Because now I have a bridge. I can be like, oh, you remember when I, um, you know, hooked you up with that paper? Can you hook me up with an introduction to this person? So networking is going to be really important. So you want to cultivate your online persona. And it's really important that you start doing this now because you don't want it to come back and bite you. Okay? Because people, we're plugged in now. And this is very important. So LinkedIn, do you have a professional picture? Do you have good connections? Right? There's, there's connections with other you know, graduate students, other buddies. But are you also making high profile connections? So, you know, your PI, other people in your field. So you want to reach out to other people in your field so that they get to know you. Um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what are you putting out there, right? So some things are appropriate and some things will be not appropriate, right? So you want to make sure that if it's something that could potentially be viewed in a negative connotation, you need to hide that. So you don't want them, when they Google search you, to pick up a picture of you, you know, chugging a beer or something like that, right? I mean, because they will Google search you. They'll put your first name, last name, and then Nevada, and see what comes up. You should do that to see what comes up under your name. You don't want these kind of associations that may put you in a bad light. So when you actually start applying, they're going to have packets, generally, that they expect you to fill out. You have to follow the directions. Nothing is more annoying than when people don't follow directions. And so if you have an incomplete packet, they will throw it out. They won't bother to tell you. They will just throw it out. So it's really important that for everything they ask, you check it off your list. I have this, I have this, I have this in all the formats that they asked me to put them in. So if they ask for PDFs, you better not be giving them Word documents. Okay? Uh, check and recheck for typos and grammar. You've probably put this together and looked at it 20 times. You're blind to it now. So hand it to somebody else and say, look through there, does anything seem weird? You know, did I, did I miscapitalize anything? Did the sentence structure make sense? Having fresh eyes and look at it is going to be really, really important. And then strong references. So you want your references and the people that are going to be, you know, writing your recommendation letters or being uh, reached out to well, over the phone to know what you're applying for. So that if they get that phone call, they can be like, oh, yeah, they've already told me about this job. They're very excited about it. And then they can craft you the most beautiful reference ever. But if you just say, I'm applying for some jobs, they're going to write you a very basic, generic recommendation letter, which is not going to make you stand out. Because all the professors generally, they're great. They're wonderful. Why are they great for this position? Why, you know, why would they hire you again if they had the chance? 
you want them to sell you hardcore. And then tailor your application for the job. So you just you know print off 20 generic CVs and hand it to them, you don't stand out, right? Your personal statement, this is where you sell you. Why this job, right? Because if it's just generic, I'm thinking you're just mass bombing any job. You don't care about this, you, you don't care. So, skill sets. Um, you're more than just your project. And you need to realize that you're more than just the project you've been spending a good chunk of your time on, right? Even though it feels like you're just your project. Communication. You've obviously learned how to verbalize and how to write at this point, or you should have learned how to do these. Sell that, right? So if you've been a teaching instructor, right? Sell that. If you've given presentations at conferences, <coughs> sell that. The more that you can play up necessary skills that would be applicable in future jobs, the better off you're going to be. So interpersonal. I have dealt with a variety of personalities, and I can work with them. Because that's in the real world, you're going to have people you hate working with. And you have to functionally work with them. So being able to say, you know, conflict management, yes, I can do that. Uh, managing uh, people underneath me, I can do that. Passing information up the chain, I can do that. They want to know that you're going to be able to be a team member and potentially a team leader. Research and planning, you obviously can do that because the idea is you're going to get your PhD, you're going to get your master's. You should have been able to do research, right? So how did you do your research? You know, do you have a lot of computer background? You know, like with um, sciences, it could be bioinformatics, it could be Excel, it could be any of those kind of programs. Uh, organizational skills. You should have been organized in order to get a PhD, but how did you do it? So it's time management, right? Setting goals, meeting goals. Being able to do the expectations and exceed expectations when it came to your boss. Can you show them that you did that? Because then they want you when you can show that. And then management. Did you have undergrads under you? Did you have other graduate students that you were involved with? You know, did you have a project that branched out into other projects that you were responsible for? show them that you have ownership and that you're really good at delegating because they don't want someone that's going to micromanage everything. Can you delegate to other people and still get a good product at the end, right? And then this one is super important, I can tell you that based on experience, is you're going to have to look at your boss, you're going to have to look at the work environment you're in, the city, and what's the end goal? What are you trying to do? Because there are some crazy bosses out there, okay? Um, and you need to realize that. So generally, you're going to get a feel for that more when you do the interviewing process. They may seem beautiful on paper. And then you meet them and you go, this, between us, this will not work. I had that instance. I was like, this is going to be a dream job. It's check, check, check. They're, they're hitting all my marks. I got there. Nobody was there to meet me at the building. So I'm just sitting there because I took a taxi, okay? They show up an hour later. Oh, sorry, 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 okay. So I go in and nobody's in the lab. And I'm, I'm like, it's 10 o'clock, why isn't anybody in the lab? Oh, they, they come in late. Okay, <coughs> no So then they kind of start trickling in and they're fighting as they come into this workspace. And I'm just, you know, sitting there with the boss and I'm just kind of like, huh, why are they, f they can see they don't know me and yet they're fighting with each other in front of me. That's not good. So then I go out to lunch with them, and it's a group of five, and four of them ignore me, and one talks to me. But the other four ignore me. And then I come back, and I have one-on-one -on -one interviews with all of those people, and they say, don't come work here. You'll hate it. And then I meet with the boss, and he says, these people are horrible. I'm so, I really, I would really like you to come work here. And so I'm just, at that point, there's fear, right? There's a little bit of fear. And so I, I get home. Uh, the next day, and I get an email about 9 p.m. that night offering me the job. I'm like, fantastic. Okay, I'll think about it. 3 a.m., I get a text message. Are you going to accept the job or not? So, obviously, there were a lot of red flags with that, right? But on paper, this person was perfect. They had the reputation that should have launched me if I had gone with them. But this didn't work, right? I would have been miserable for usually most po postdocs between two to four years if you don't have to go to a second postdoc. So 
there's other people, um, I had a friend that they finished their PhD at Virginia Tech and they had two postdoc offers. And the first postdoc offer was their dream boss, but it was in a city that uh, they, they were from the country originally, they did not want to live in the big city, um, it just wasn't going to work. And then they had an offer from not such a dream boss, but it was a perfect environment to raise their family. So it was a question of which one do you take? And so he had to balance that, and he ended up choosing neither, and went and found a third position. But those are things you're going to have to take into consideration, because you have your personal life, and you have to take into account what will make you happy in your personal life, because it's not all work. And so, you know, do you like big cities? Do you like smaller cities? Uh, work environment, are you a person that likes to collaborate, interact a lot, or are you more of a person like, let me do my job, and then we're good? Depending on the environment, you may be expected to pick up other people's slack. Do you want to have to do that? Some people, they're like, pile it on, I love it. And other people, no, this is what I signed on for. I'm to get in here, get what I need to get done, get out so that I can get to the next position. So it depends on, you've got to decide what is going to make you happy. Because if you're miserable, your, your quality of work will suffer. And then, you know, what you plan on doing in the future will suffer. So you need to get wrapped around now what you think you want, at least right now. Because you've already had work experiences. What did you like? What didn't you like? And that can help shape you to decide what you're going to do, what you will and won't settle for. Interviews. Nowadays, we have all kinds of interviews. There may be telephone interviews. There may be Skype interviews. In person, I've done all three. I did a telephone interview with somebody from Scotland. Did a Skype interview for the one here. And I also did an in-person one for the one here. And so you have to be prepared to do all three. And so with the telephone, you better make sure you have a solid connection because nothing's worse than you know, breaking up in the middle, right? Same thing with Skype. Obviously, you should be dressed appropriately. It should be quiet environment. You know, you're ready to talk. You're always on. That's the thing with interviews. Is as soon as you show up, you are on, and you are not off until everything is turned off and it's two hours later, okay? And so with the interviews, how you treat other people, they're going to be watching them. So, you know, when you get out of the taxi cab, how did you treat the driver? When you're at the hotel, how are you treating the, you know, the concierge? How are you treating the receptionist? And you can watch how your potential boss or your potential colleagues also treat these people. Because that can give you insight into potentially what they're going to be like to work with. And so, again, you're always on when you're interviewing. And then know your why. Why you? Saying, you know, I'm a hard worker. I'm good. I don't care. There's lots of hard workers. There's lots of good people out there. Why you for this position? So you got to do your research. You need to dig. What is that position? What is that project? What do you bring that, you know, Janice doesn't bring, Jerome doesn't bring? Why you? And then why them? Right? Oh, this is, you know, it's Harvard. It's a really good school. I already know it's a really good school, right? You're not selling me on why me. You know, what is it about this project that is going to get you excited? Why is this project so special that you want it? You desperately want it versus it's kind of related to my field. It was good enough, right? Again, it's it's selling that relationship that you want to develop between you and the boss. And then start, I actually pulled this off the internet. The idea is a lot of times with um, interviews, they ask you different types of questions. They'll, they'll lead with the, tell me about yourself question. And so then how do you answer that? You know, you can do the personal route. Don't do the personal route. They don't need to know your business, right? It's more work route. What gets you excited with regard to work? Why were you so into your project? What drew you to this field in the first place? And then they'll ask you behavioral questions. Tell me about a time that something failed. And you need to have an organized response. Something that sticks in their head and they'll remember in a good way, not in a bad way. So, what was the situation? Be to the point, don't get all wordy on them. Task, what did you need to get done? Actions, what did you do to get it done? Results, did it work or did it not work? And then what was the takeaway? Because sometimes you screw up and it's a train wreck, but you still get something out of it. As long as you can show 
you got something out of it, it was worthwhile. And they need to see that. That is the end of my view. Well, thank you, Dr. Strong. And I think uh, what, one takeaway from your talk, too, is um, the jobs you may be applying to may vary by field. So you may be applying for tenure track faculty jobs. You may be applying for more teaching oriented positions, maybe postdocs. You may be doing multiple things simultaneously. Something to consider uh, as well. But we'll now uh, transition over to Dr. Choi. Table jurors. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. And my name is CB. I'm a assistant professor at Hawthorne College. And this is my second year at UNIB. So actually, even last year, I was on the job market. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about some advice based on my experience. So it might be confined to like a hospitality and tourism area, or also it can be applied for like some applied discipline, but it cannot be applied for like a hard science. So please consider that one. So I think like before you entering the job market, you need to prepare based on like a three component. First one is research, of course, because we are pursuing the academic job. So research is very important. So it's better to have like a, some publication in the like a top tier journals. And so first one is research. And the second one is teaching. I find like a lot of school, a lot of university want to see whether these candidates qualify to teach under a course or even like a graduate course. Because we are not only competing with the PhD candidate with other different schools, but we also compete with the, some assistant professor in different school. For example, in UNLB, when I applied to UNLB, I've, I heard that like a lot of assistant professors from different universities have also applied. So I need to compete with them. So in order to stand out, in order to like compete with them, I need to have some like teaching experience. So if you don't have any teaching experience, I think it might be better to have some like a guest lecture just like a knock on the like, other, faculty, other faculty's office and ask like uh, whether there is some like a guest lecture opportunity. So I think like that's a, like a one way to build up with your teaching experience if you don't have like any. And third one, as I say, it might be only applied for the applied discipline such as like a hospitality management, but we need to have some like a job experience, practical industry experience. Because I find like a lot of faculty thinks like how can we teach without having like any practical implication in the industry? They saw like that doesn't make any sense. So if you don't have any job experience, I think it's better to have like a some summer internship during the like a summer break or some industry projects so that you can show you can so much show. Hey, look! I have some like industry connection. I, I have some like industry experience, so I can apply this experience to the, my teaching. So I think like uh, that's like a third one. And of course, like a uh, fourth one is grant writing, but I didn't have any like a grant writing experience. So, and honestly, for like a social science, it's really hard to have like those kind of experience. But if you have those kind of experience, that's good. But I think that's not really critical in social science and discipline. So, and so that's like a, some recommendation before you enter the job market and during the job search process, it's kind of what she said, is I think like a, one of very important thing is attend like a, some major conference in your discipline. And I kind of like a break down into like a two step so before you attending the like some major conference in your discipline, check your conference schedule, and then you can identify who is coming, who which faculty member is coming from your target university, and once you identify who's coming from that target university, and read their research, I think like that's a, that's a very important way to communicate with them. Just rather than talking with like some useless stuff, if you talk about their research and what is like a common factor with their research with your research, I think that's like it, that's the best way to attract more attention from them. So I think that's a very important things. And at 
the conference, of course, based on those information, do networking. I think, like as she said, like networking is very important. So as I said, just rather than talking about the useless stuff, talk about your research and talk about their research and how you were impressed about their research and if there's any future idea based on their research, discuss about those stuff. I think that's very important. So once you attract their attention based on those topics and then express your interest to your that the target university. How am I qualified and why you're interested in that university, such as something like that. And once you talk about those research and finally I think last but I think this is most important is invite them to your presentation. So of course you need to do a very good job in your present research presentation, but invite them and this is a very good way to show how you, you are qualified in terms of this job description or this faculty job. So that's my comment and this is what I did two years ago. So from my experience, I think in 2004 summer, I attend a major conference. That time I was like a fourth year in the PhD at Penn State. And I attend a major conference in the hospitality area and I did networking based on like uh, some information search about their research interests or like uh, what is their research area. So I could successfully attract their attention. Then I invite them to my presentation. Of course, I thought I did a good job on that presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so in that way, they show like a great interest to me. And that, that way I did like a Skype interview and campus visit and finally get this job. So that was my suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn it over to Dr. Ray. Okay. Uh, my name is Renita, and I'm a sociologist. So um, this applies more so to listening to especially your talk at a little different, uh, moderately different, actually, or um, on the major side. <laughs> so this applies if you're a social scientist, anthropologist, sociologist, or probably to humanities a little bit. Uh, but I graduated in 2013 and found this job and I have been twice on the job search committee. I was a grad rep back at UConn and we were hiring for three positions and we had 500 applications. And I'm currently on a job search committee as a sociologist. <clears throat> we are hiring um, someone this year so we just had our first meeting. So there are things that I knew before um, you know, being on the market and the things that I found out literally this morning. Um, <laughs> so I'll tell you the thing I literally found out this morning. Apply as soon as the position opens. People get so tired by the time they reach the 150th applicant after looking through all their package. It's called the fatigue syndrome, apparently. It's a thing. I didn't even know because I'm a last minute person. I literally applied for the job like, you know, 11.59 when it was due as well. But so don't do that. I apply early on, apparently. This is a good pointer. But um, so if you're a social scientist, so by now I assume you already will have had three components on your CV. Number one are publications. Central, I was looking at the CVs, people have like hot publications. You know, there are uh, CVs with a tremendous amount of publications. Make sure you do that. You should have done that. That's key. If you don't have publications, we literally no pops and put them in like leave them and rank one and never move them. Number two are grants. People have these days a lot of grants, NSF, NIH. Fort Foundation, other sort of private organizations, you need to, so there are, we're judging based on these criteria, we're insider information, we're judging based on publications, we're judging whether those publications are independent, that is, you just get on board with your, especially with social scientists, you need to have an independent research agenda. Um, so publications, are they independent publications? Grants, awards, right? Do you have like paper awards, do the paper of yours win uh, some sort of like competition? Um, teaching, that is especially if you've gone to a top program, been in grad school for nine years with zero teaching, people tend to weigh you in a different way versus say you have your know, decent record of publication and you also taught. Um, so th there are different ways of weighing that. So if you've taught, it should be a plus. Um, so teaching and then also if you're a good fit, so make sure, um, not just in your cover letter, but people don't even get to the cover letter. If they see your CV and you have, we're hiring for race and ethnicity, but you have no pubs in race and ethnicity, you, you know, even your research interest does not say race and ethnicity, people push out. So whether it'll be a good fit. So 
um, assuming you already have those components on your CV, right? Now it's a matter of how you sell that CV. Uh, make sure your job ad is sort of as if like when they read that CV, they're like, oh, you're the person that was born to do this job kind of thing. So if, say, say race and ethnicity with minor area in, um, say, urban, then make sure you go back to your CV and tweak it. It might seem a lot of hard work, especially if you're applying for a large amount of jobs, but at least do it for the jobs that um, you really, really want to, you know, you would take. Um, and then go to the research interest in the statement of purpose or whatever that's called cover letter. Make sure you mention the university and the people in the university. Search everyone up. See what their research interests are. And say how specifically your work jives, which is kind of different because you all go to like work with specific bosses, but we're working with a whole department. So read up everyone's CV and say, oh, with Dr. So-and-so, you know, I can work on this. Uh, Dr. So-and-so. At the same time, don't, you know, um, get into other people's business because then they say something called, well, oh, you're too similar to this other person. So there are a bunch of applicants who were like very similar to me and they were like, oh no, that's not. I was like, oh, that's exciting because they do the same thing. They were like, no, we can't handle two U's. So maybe <laughs> 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 that for other reasons too. But anyway, so um, make sure you stand out while it's saying how you collaborate with them. Um, and then make the CV, of course, very readable. Like don't put publications and then put like a book review that you wrote, you know, make it as, you know, uh, other publications, you know, in your publications try to separate the ones that are independent, that are noticeable, the rest people figure out and they're like, oh, just padding and make, making more work for us, right? Make sure you have a teaching section, make sure you have a research section, you have a research experience section, like all these sections nicely done on PDF and all that so people don't get annoyed at you, like you don't want them to cross you out even before they see, see you, right? Um, so make sure they, they jive with all of that. Make sure you read everyone's uh, work and then potentially, I even read up like their articles and everything and sort of um, all of that. And then um, the other thing is, yeah, you should already network. And this is what I'm noticing is that oftentimes people will say, everybody gave this to like a couple of candidates, nobody ranked them high except for one person. They would come and they would make the case for that person. I had seen so and so in this conference. Like for us, we don't have a job conference that we go to in the last year, so don't wait if you're in social science to go in your final year. Like, you should start going year one. You, know, you should have started going. And so now you can call on those references, actually. You could email a person you know and tell them, hey, I'm applying for this job. Do you think you know, I'd be a good fit? So that they have your name. Their mind. So people will often sort of campaign for someone and say, oh, you know, I know you overlook this person, but can you go back and look at their CV once again, because I think they're really good. Um, so make sure that happens. So that is really paying off. Like all our top candidates, right now we made a long list of 15 for Skype. Like one of us at least knows of them or they're, you know, so that kind of really, really is uh, standing out to be important. Of course, their work has to be good. There are a bunch of people we know, but, you know, we don't care for them kind of thing. And then. Um, of course, you get the Skype, and you know you have to woo them because remember, by this time, they have like ten favorite candidates, so you better stand out at this point, right? Tell them again, talk to them personally, tell them I know this work of yours, and that because that's what I did. I was like, oh, that I read that article, it was fantastic, blah blah blah, and then you tell them, um, you know, some people we're picking whose research we don't really feel excited about, but we're hoping that they'll come here and do something that will jive better with us. So make sure you have this future research thing very well planned for the social sciences. Your dissertation is done, and you're going to do something that fits with us. And this is where they're going to get you. They're going to, you know, slash you sort of out if you don't fit. So make sure you tell them, especially if you're coming to a city like Las Vegas, people often have this idea that, oh, people won't come here. So convince them you're going to come here. Because now, we're not just judging candidates who we like. We're also trying to figure out, by telepathy literally, whether they'll actually come because we don't want to make three offers and have a fatal search, right? So convince them you will go, like if you're applying to a job in North Dakota and you're from Las Vegas, they're going to wonder, oh, are you really going to come here? So convince them that you are going to go there um, and, and do this in the Skype and in your cover letter. Um, yeah, and then, you know, whatever, have a good Skype and whatnot. And then when you go to the campus and everything you said, like you want to be nice to people around you, don't be mean, you know, be, um, had you heard this, someone on the Skype was blowing their nose too much and so people didn't like them. I don't even know how to like, actually structure that, but you know, but it's not just about blowing nose, it, like, you know, sort of like, and this sounds really horrible, but it happens, you know. Um, and then, of course, you go to campus, you're, you know, being nice to everyone. Remember, by the time they've taken you to campus, they like all three. So your talk is literally the make or break. You have to give a fantastic talk if you're in social sciences. I literally like memorized my talk, but pretended like I was just saying it, right? I had, I had given the talk like 10 times, 
Um, and then I was just like saying it like, you know, I was so articulate and I had no um and ahs and all that. So you have to do that. You have to memorize the talk and um, give a, a fantastic presentation, then talk to everyone personally. And remember, when people are voting for you, it's everyone is one vote, right? So you have to please every one of them. You know, I told people, oh, your book was fantastic. You know, where the book sucked. At least I thought it sucked. I was like, a oh, fantastic book. Like, you know, it's like I read it so much, it's all torn apart. Like, things that like we have a book culture, so we write books. But to read on everyone. Like, I read people whose studies I didn't care about, but I went for dinner and I talked about their article, you know. And I said, oh, that's a fantastic article. Like, I thought this is what you did well, and that method, that statistical tool was nice to use. And they were like, oh, really? Wow. We've never heard of the qualitative ethnographers, like, read our article and things like that. So do those, each person is one vote, you're pleasing each one of them, and now you've already you know, made the cut, you're in. It's a matter of each person for one vote. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Dr. Ray. So we have plenty of time, and um, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of things just for all of us to consider that I think are probably on our minds. What, or just one observation, it is very competitive. Mm -hmm. So have no doubt, based on the comments from the three of you, this is a very competitive process. Um, and you have to stand out. So you're selling yourself, and that will start in the networking and your fine work through your graduate years, and then this is almost the culmination of that process. Uh, but sell yourself in your application letter, tailor that application letter, I heard that comment, so if it's a research-oriented position, research goes first, teaching-oriented position, highlight the teaching relevance and experience and ability to teach in that context. Um, but maybe, um, things that could surface in this conversation too, be more about where to find positions. So we heard of Indeed, for example, but any other uh, tips in that regard, but also uh, other details perhaps of the application letter itself, length, things to mention, not mention, uh, all that, but we'll open up for other specific questions that might build on those, those few observations. I have two specific questions for Bermuda. With the, the dual author publication, is it much of a difference if you're second or first author with your professor? Yeah, I think first author definitely makes a difference. But what we noticed, what I noticed is that if you have a super top journal, maybe with a dual author, first or second, people count. But like if you have, you know, already lower ranked journal, it's sort of just like people don't even consider it as a publication. Like because it's so competitive, people have top journal solo authored. So it just sort of like even for teaching schools, people have that. So it's just sort of like already. Uh, yeah, but that does make a difference, but if you're on the market, you're aiming to be a solo author in a top journal, you should imagine that everyone's CV looks like that, because it does, like we had 100 applicants, and it's just like, and for social sciences, the places are higher ed, inside higher ed, Chronicle, and then the associations, like ASA, and American Sociological Association, like, and those places are good for jobs, and then there's the rumor mill. Don't go in there, though. It might be scared. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a second question. On the grants, I know you mentioned several different grants. Are all grants created equal? If you get a grant, you're a rock star, or...? Yeah, if you're like NSF, student? or like I had an NSF dissertation improvement guide and a grant, and, that's, and looking back, you know, I thought I was special, but not really. There were so many CVs with that, especially, you know. I mean, at least I would say 15% of the CVs had like an NSF or NIH, you know. So you want to aim for those, or...? I mean, you get or get anything, then nothing, right? Um, but then there's four, there are private grants, um, and then there are awards, like sending your paper for these awards, like section awards and all of that, like if you're at NSF, uh, at ASA and all that. So there's two separate categories. Some people are getting zero in awards, five in grants, and you know. And then they're internal, external. Some faculty in our department give zero, like if you didn't get any external awards, they're like, who cares about your department? <laughs> That is the attitude. They're like, I don't care. You, your professor might have just liked you and given you an award, like best paper award. It doesn't matter, kind of thing. Um, I have a question also for sociology. Um, how big of a difference does it make up for the search committee if you're applying while you're ABD versus PhD in hand? Like, is it a big problem or a big question? I think it's the correspondence of time. So sometimes we look at someone and we'll say, well, you've been in grad school for 10 years and you've had only like two pubs. Eh, we don't think so. You know, it's sort of like how productive are you, right? Now, if you've been out like two years and you have a lot of pub, then they're like, okay, fine. But it's a good question. In our search, what we're seeing is that people will get a sense of whether you'll be able to defend or not, but that comes in at, around Skype or like the job doc, where they start to see if you're prepared or not, right? There were some conversations that we had a lot of applicants from Duke and we were like, oh, 
they've only been in the program like three years after master's. Like how close are they to finishing? And then we realize actually do forces you to do your master's again before your PhD, even if you had it. But then they do the same project, you know? So we figured that out. But yeah, so they don't, if you've been out too long and have nothing, that's bad, right? So that you have to have, so the average is if you're six years and you have like two or three solid pubs and a grant and a word, you know, good. Again, if you've been there six years and you have one super solid pub that won lots of awards, also good, you know? But yeah, the time versus that thing is important, if that makes sense. Good question. Um, so my question is a little bit about networking. Um, when you're at events and conferences, how appropriate is it to bring up um, jobs during your conversations with these people? Totally. Yeah, and have business cards with, with your first name, last name, and then make sure that you, in a perfect world you use your university um, email address because when you send out emails, it's less likely to get shunted into the garbage. I've, I've noticed that because people are like, oh, I emailed you. Let's see it. So <laughs> Yahoo, Gmail, garbage. Um, but yeah, they're they're expecting it. They're used to it. That's how I found out about things. That they're because my boss was like, oh yeah, she's you know. You're out. She's gonna. She'd be applying. They're like, oh, you know, who would be a good fit for her? So putting it out there, you know, I'm coming up on it. That they're expecting. Yeah. When you're applying for academic jobs, how long would you say you should wait in between saying, okay, I don't think I got it. Let me try something else. Or do they usually call back and say we chose someone else? Because there'll be closing dates on it. Because usually it opens, it closes, and then um, first round is, is the telephone interviews. And so they'll let you know, like, okay. if you're not in the telephone group, that no, this is not going to happen. And then the telephone group, they'll narrow it down <coughs> further. And then usually they'll say, you know, if you made it, you made okay. it, you'll get to go on campus. And if you didn't get to do on campus, then. And we had a, um, a professor, he, it was, it ended up being a failed search at my old university the first time around because the, the two people they, they had selected um, decided not to. And the person that had previously applied for that position got two more papers within that next year and then applied again and secured the position. So sometimes failed searches can benefit you if it gives you enough time to bump up your CV. So if you're really interested in that university, keep an eye on it just to make sure that they lock that position down because it may come back open. I think that depends on like the university. This is my experience, but it's really funny. But almost like a two months ago, I applied like a desk school like a twenty third months ago. But during August, I got like a rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> that was very courteous. Of yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're in social sciences, assumably you're already, we had like 64 tenure track positions, I think, last year. Don't quote me on this. And about like 1,000 PhDs. So I'm assuming that you're already applying for like, say, I don't know, 20, 40, 50, whatever jobs, right? And so you're in the process and then rejections will keep coming, you know, and then you'll get those, that two or three, hopefully. So yeah. Any other questions? So I'll say, uh, any resources you'd recommend? So talk, maybe talk to your advisor or advisors as well, because some of the, the advice will be discipline specific. That's another thing perhaps to draw from this. Um, there are plenty of online resources. We've got a, a, a few allusions to some of those, but Chronicle of Higher Ed, for example, Higher Ed Jobs. So these are places to look for jobs, but also um, pieces online about this very process. Uh, there's a book by an anthropology faculty member who left academia recently called Carrie Karen Kelsko, I think her name is. I forget um, the name of it. The professor is in. Is the yeah, doctor? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Cheryl, I, I recommended this for anthro grad students. The professor is in. Uh, this was just published last year, but it draws on many of her chronicle of higher ed uh, pieces. But it, it discusses the same process in very specific detail, and it's very blunt. Just as we heard today, there is there are a lot more PhDs manufactured than there are tenure track faculty jobs. So these are all things one needs to think very carefully about and to do really, really well because you have a nanosecond to make a positive impression on a search committee member who's exhausted reading through the 150th application in an online portal at 11.59 p.m. By the way, if you go to one page, you take it's a bad portal. But. <laughs> and also the other thing is that, um, oh gosh, I should go that. I was, there's 
point has been made by totally for that. Okay. <laughs> Just like right there. Uh, well, if no other thoughts, uh, well, thank you for taking the time, our panelists. We, we appreciate it. And for all of you for uh, joining us today for this, this, this session. Thank you. Thank you.